Welcome back to our circle of healing and recovery. The elders say it's important for us to practice silence. They say, whenever we get together as a group or as an individual, we should start by being still. I want you to take the next two minutes to get quiet and say a prayer to our Creator and ask Him to put words and thoughts in your mind which will help you focus. In this portion of our workshop, we're going to go in quite a lot of detail around finding the instructions and following the instructions for the fourth step of our recovery process. So once again, let's begin with the instructions to be found in the Foundation Recovery Text on pages 63 through 70. And they're quite explicit instructions. After the part that I looked at before with you on the third step prayer, it's very specific. It says, next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning. So this step says, made a fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. Many of us got here thinking we could do an inventory of other people. And many of our first attempts at inventory were great descriptions of how the world had done us wrong. But it doesn't have that coded into the instructions. It's very specific around looking at ourselves. And so the instructions here between pages 63 and 70 talk about multiple inventories. They talk about a resentment inventory a fear inventory, a sex inventory. And then there's some instructions on writing down our vision or our ideal of what our future sex life would be like. So let's look a little further. Why are we doing this anyhow? What, what is this about, this fearless and searching moral inventory? It sounds terrifying words to me. Well, just the fact that they wrote down fearless means, sort of makes, bring up, well, what was I afraid of? Well, when I get over that, I realize they're trying to help us not approach this as if some, some sort of penalty. But in fact, the fourth step inventory process is like mining for gems. It's not about digging up a septic system and looking at all of the sewage. We're mining for gems here. We're looking for the truth. So the truth that's here will set us free. What kind of truth would that be? Well, it would be truth about patterns of habits, attitudes, beliefs, and expectations that we have programmed into our subconscious mind. Past patterns of thinking and behavior that have brought about our current results. This is how we have a look at the dials of the autopilot system we talked about. What is this autopilot system of our life set on? What are the current settings? So we're going in here mining for that kind of information. The truth will set us free. So there's a reminder here that going into this part, we're no longer in this alone. This is where this fearless comes in. Self-will and an ego orientation to doing an inventory would perhaps end up as fearful. What if I see things I don't want to see? What if I can't stand it? What if, what if, what if? I. But at this point, we're in here with the Creator. So we're not alone in our fourth step. We made a choice in our third step to turn our will and our lives over to the care of a power greater than ourselves. And we're into this fourth step with the, this power. So one of the things that we tell people is when we go into these inventories, write down on the top of the forms. And we're going to be showing you in the workbooks some forms. And these are just extrapolations of the instructions out of the, the book. We, suggest that people write up a little prayer to remind themselves that God's in on this with them. 
Something like this. God, please help me to be honest. Help me to have courage. Help me to see what I need to see. And help me to finish this inventory. A lot of people in recovery get partway into this and lose their courage. And they really, it's a risky point. We're ris risking relapse to the degree that we go in there and, and sort of back out. Have the faith. Have the courage. You're mining for information that could change your life. Now, the other thing I'd like to talk about, when, what goes on with us when we're in this fourth step? I, I always call it the transparent skin phase. When I'm in inventory and looking at myself this intensively, I think everyone else can see my stuff. It's like somehow my skin goes transparent and all of my stuff is available for everyone to see. But that's not really so. It's just how I feel. But a lot of other people experience it the same way. We feel quite vulnerable. So my guidance on that that I use for myself and for other people is get in and get out. Don't wallow in this. This is not a place to go in and just hang around sort of like a nice trip into the swamp to uh, pick some reeds to build a basket with, but I don't want to live in the swamp, thank you very much. Okay. So get in and get out. There's valuable information for you in here, in each one of these inventories. Get in and get out. Have the courage to see what you need to see. Stay there long enough to see what you need to see. Don't stay there any longer and wallow in it or add things that aren't there. So. Getting organized for these inventories, we usually get out some sheets. And the sheets will be a, a sheet for resentments, a worksheet for fears, a worksheet for sex. And then we'll be, I always have a spare sheet. It's a blank page. And it's, I keep a little scratch pad going because sometimes when I start writing on my resentment inventory, things pop up that are fears. And I started worrying, I used to worry, well, what if I forget this before I need it? So today when I'm writing these, I'm writing an inventory on resentments and a fear pops up. I jot it on this little piece of paper and say, thank you very much. I'll get to you in a minute or in a couple of hours or whenever I'm ready. And I go right back to my other inventory. So what I'm supposed to be focusing my attention on right now is the resentment inventory. Now, so I get myself organized. I get my worksheets, get my coffee or tea or whatever. I get my pencil. I get my big book. And I settle down in. And what I've learned over the years is if I'll show up with willingness and readiness. God will show me what I need to write on the paper and help me write it. It seems like the pencil just starts to go. Now it goes in these forms. So in your workbooks, I thought it would be easier if we just looked at the workbook. There's a page here that has a form for resentment inventory. And it's got five columns on it. And the columns start with the name of the person, place, institution, or principal that you're resentful at, the cause, what they did to you, how did that hurt, threaten, or affect a variety of things, what were your mistakes or my mistakes, and then is there an amend needed? Let me just do this a little bit in street talk here. So what, how does this work? Well, the son of a bitch's name goes in the first column. That so-and-so that did that dastardly deed to me, their name goes in this first column. What goes in the second column? My version of what they did. <laughs> this is what that so-and-so did. Let me tell you about it. Right. This is the script here. <laughs> right. Now, in the third column, hurts, threatens, or affects my There are several things I look at. Did it hurt, threaten, or affect my self-esteem? How do I know that? Well, my self-esteem is who I think I am. So this is my script about the truth about who I am. And did this dastardly person and their dastardly deeds have a negative impact on my self-esteem? Did it hurt, threaten, or affect my personal relations? And in this case, the way we use this, I would put in there, men are or should be. It's a script. Right? And the second column is how they violated the script. Men are should be a certain way, should think of a certain way, they should behave a certain way. And what I'll find is my description of how they should be doesn't match up to the way that they've been acting in the second column. That starts to give me a couple of pieces of information. It tells me how I think they acted 
It also tells me how I thought they should have acted, which may or may not be how people should act. It's my version of it. In the piece on hurts, threatens, or affects my sexual relationships, that I use women are or should be. The opposite sex. Hurts, threatens, or affects my ambitions. This is something I want or hope for that somehow is being negatively impacted by this dastardly deed to this dastardly person. Hurts, threatens, or affects my security, something that I think I need, and I name it. Hurts, threatens, or affects my pocketbook. A lot of resentments seem to tie back to our pocketbooks. Okay. And fear. What is exactly the fear that I have? So what I've got here is the person, my version of what they did, and a whole lot of information around my patterns of thinking and behavior, my scripts on how people should think and behave. Isn't it interesting? I start out talking about them, and what I've got is information about me. That's the gems. This third column really gives us the gems. They're a bit player in this scenario. They're just here to help us see us. It's not a story about them, it's a story about us. Now I can use that to look for what were my mistakes or what we might call character defects. What defective thinking and behavior did I have relative to this situation? That goes in the fourth column. And if it turns out that that defective thinking and behavior has caused harm to someone, then I put a name in the fifth column for my amends list later on. Let me use a live example here. When I got into recovery, life had not gone all that perfect for me from, from birth. Uh, when I was born, my mother was in the hospital giving birth to this handsome young man, and my father was being checked into a mental hospital, having yet another mental breakdown. Uh, I think it was his third one, and there were three children. There may be a pattern here. I don't know. But my father was a farm worker, and farm workers in those days, at least in the part of the country I was raised in, got room and board. They got a house to live in of sorts. They got farm produce and a, a sort of minimum sort of living wage of some sort, a little bit of cash. So when my father went in the hospital, the farmer needed to find another farm worker, so my mother had no place to return to. So she decided that uh, she couldn't cope, and placed me out with one of her sisters. Now, as I try to piece this together as an adult, it looks different perhaps than I saw it as a child, but it seems like there was no discussion around whether this was forever or for a little while. But when I was three years old, there was a big family bust up, and I got claimed back from the sister, my aunt, back into a family, my family of origin. Now, the family I'd been living with was treating me really good. They hadn't had any children of their own yet. They really loved me. They were a, a young couple who'd sort of made a few breaks for themselves. My uncle actually had a real job with regular wages, with benefits. They lived in a real house. And we lived in this cardboard shack. It was a wood frame building with tar paper over the outside and cardboard boxes on the inside where most people today would have sheetrock. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We didn't have electricity. And it was two rooms, probably not as big as this workshop facility right now. One side of it was where the family slept, and one side of it was where we had food and sitting and whatever. And that, so I don't think I was too pleased with this being pulled back on this string. And certainly there was a lot of conflict. And I remember very early on thinking, I don't like being part of this family. I would always seem to be at odds with my two older brothers. And I was accused of being a rebel. And all this, who do you think you are? Go over there, you spend a couple weeks with them, you get fed better, and then you come back here and, and we got to shape you up. You know, they're always shaping me up. Get me back in the shape of this family. And so taking that in terms of the stages of development, what do you think happened with my trust? Right. Well, I don't know. Might have been a little disrupted. Initiative, autonomy. Those early stages really got mashed around. Now, even if I had bounced back from that, which probably I didn't, when I was eight years old, I was sexually abused by a man who was a friend of the family. And it just sort of piled up here. Here's this family I don't want to be with, any, with anyhow, and they can't or won't protect me from bad things and bad people. 
And I remember being really pissed off and thinking, I'm out of here. I know as early as 10 years old, I was plotting how I was getting out of this family and I was going to make it on my own. And activating that, you know, when I was 11 and 12 years old and, and making a, a break quite early, um, at least from really being an integral part of the family. Now, how does this play back to this resentment thing? What's that story about? Well, the story is when I got there, I had a couple of resentments, you might guess. One of these resentments was my mother. Right? Dear old mom in the first column, what did she do? Placed me out with an aunt and uncle and then pulled me back like some damn rag doll on a string when I was three years old into a situation that was worse for me, didn't care about me, that's what she wanted. How does this hurt, threaten, or affect my self-esteem? Well, what am I? Some toy that people can just move around the way they want to? How about personal relationships? Well, I got a resentment about my father. I need to work there. That's another one. How about sex relationships? How about mothers are or should be? Mothers should take care of their children, not place them in those situations, on and on and on. Mothers, if they've placed them out and it's a better situation, they ought to leave them. Right, this was my script. It didn't have to be right. It's my script. What are my ambitions? I want to be loved. I want to be nurtured. I want to be safe. I want to be somebody. What's my need, my security? I want to feel safe. I want to be loved. Has affect my pocketbook? Well, it affected in a funny way. It made me very independent, and money became very important to me because it was a means of escaping, getting out of there, making my way in the world. What am I afraid of? That I really am some piece of crap that people can do what they want to with. Now, what's my mistake? Well, I'm 33 years old when I finally look at this, and I'm still thinking about it like a seven or eight-year-old. I never looked at her side of the story. What would it be like to be a woman, a mother, in that circumstance? What choices would you make? I never had a look at that. Judgmental, and all of those things. That was what was in my mistakes. And what was, there wasn't a men do. There was a men of forgiveness and understanding. So that's, that sort of thing, how this goes through these columns. Now, what goes in here is people, institutions, principles that annoy us. Internal Revenue Service gets on this list a lot for people. Police, military, churches, religions, family, friends, other drivers at traffic lights, all kinds of things get in here, right? And they're the things that we have anger about. How do you know when you got anger? Well, your whole system is out of balance. That's how you know. It's all interconnected, right? You're running around with clenched fist. You're grinding your teeth down to stubs in your sleep. You're always tense, annoyed, on the edge, little flare-ups. We know. Now, how do I know when I come to the end of my resentment inventory? I write this thing. How do I know when I come to the end of it? Well, I always think about this like when these Plate stackers in these buffet restaurants, you're going through the line, at the front of the line there's a plate stacker, they got these plates, and, and you pull it off the spring tension, it pops another plate up. My resentments are like that. I pull one off, there's another one right behind it. Pull it up, pull it up, pull it up. I get through. Eventually, there's no more plates on this stack. I go back over here looking for another resentment to write down, it, and it, nothing comes. Now, I got a choice here. I could make some up, or I could... Just assume that I'm at the end of this and get on with one of the other inventories, which would be the wiser choice. Right. So that's the resentments piece. Now, in the book, you'll find we just what we call useful definitions for step four character defects. As if a bunch of recovering people couldn't think these up for themselves, we decided to help put some in here for you. Definitions of things like anger and arrogance and disrespect and ego and fear. So these are just little guides to memory joggers. It's about three pages of those in the book. And then we have this format for fears inventory. Now the fear inventory has four columns in it. The name of the fear. What is the name of the fear that I have? Why do I have this fear? Did self-reliance fail? And what would the creator have me be? Interesting. Well, what's the name of the fear? 
fear of dying, fear of living, fear of not being able to stop drinking or drugging or gambling, uh, fear of disease, fear of unknowns. <laughs> we all have them. It's part of the human condition, it seems, particularly people who end up in recovery groups. Having been self or ego-centered, we're constantly trying to protect ourselves against them folks out there taking stuff from us or not giving us what we want. And we frequently have this fear of God or some power greater than ourselves that's going to punish us for all the stuff that we've done, if it were ever to be known. So there's a variety of things you would put in here. So why do I have this fear? Well, each one you get a different description, but why do I have it? Now sometimes these need to go back, but sometimes why I have the fear causes me to go back and put another fear in. Like if I've got a fear of dying, maybe that's not the primary fear. Maybe the fear, primary fear is pain. And I think I'm going to die painfully. <laughs> so so I've got to maybe peel these a couple of layers sometimes. But when I get these here, then I look at, did self-reliance fail? This always annoys me when I'm doing this because I always have to tick yes. If I were dependent on God to operate my life, what would I be fearful of? And so I end, I end up with this tick that says, yes, it did again. Certainly did. I was self-reliant, and self-reliance and fear go hand in hand. What would the creator have me be? Well, frequently it is trusting, unafraid, those sort of things go in that column. Same thing with this, when I've got all of the plates off the stack, then I can move on. And just in case you couldn't think up names of fears, we've got some lists of those for you too in the workbook. We want you to tax your creativity. And that then brings us to the sex inventory. Now the sex inventory, just because of space, it's 11 columns, but in your workbooks it's spread across three pages. So the first page deals with the first four columns, and it, the name of the person, place, thing, or situation goes in the first column. And then there are questions, where had we been? Selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate. And coming across, did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, bitterness? Whom did we hurt? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? And then there's a column which is just to jot some notes about what the ideal future might be like in relationship to this. So coming back to the first column of this, what goes in here? Well, certainly everyone that we've had a sexual relationship with goes in here. Just as a sort of test it through this process. It's like a little strainer. You sort of test it through to see what comes out the other side. goes in here is all of those people that we've been thinking about wanting to or fantasizing about having sexual relationships might want to go in here and see what that does as it comes across the columns then there's situations what sort of situations do we use to set up a sexual connotation or to put a sexual twist on things do we do it in the workplace do we go out to sexually oriented places. Many people end up in recovery programs, have lived in some dives in their lives. And how does that affect the patterns of our thinking? So if it happens to be that we frequented the kinds of places that trigger off of or thrive off of sexual fantasy, you might want to put those in here and walk them across these to see what it tells you about you, not about those places. What does it tell you about you? And the et cetera goes in here. And this is any patterns of sexually oriented thinking and behavior that pops to mind that we might want to inventory comes across here. And again, we're looking for information that will tell us 
Where do we have patterns of selfishness? Where do we have patterns of dishonesty? Where do we have patterns of being inconsiderate? Where do we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness? Whom did we hurt? Sometimes our name will be in here. Sometimes other people's names will be in here. But it's a means of looking for where harm has been done. Where were we at fault? That'll give us some information to use for our amends list. This whom did we hurt? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? This is, if I hadn't done that, what other choices did I have? What other options were that would have been healthier for me and other people? And then over here in this, I, so what would it be like, what would I choose to have my life be like in, relative to this in the future? So those are the columns of the, the sex inventory, all 11 of them. Now there's another piece at the end of this that I suggest we do, which is to do a little mind mapping exercise again. And this one is to set spiritual direction. If you remember, as we're coming through the steps, we're getting pieces of information about how it is. In the first step, we got a lot of information about how it is, and it made us feel like crap. We got a lot of information now out of our three inventories about how it is, and it may make us feel a little bit more like crap. See, if in the second step, it was probably looking at symptoms, the results in our life. The fourth step shows us the causes. The causes are our thinking, our behavior, our patterns, and how they manifest in our life, a variety of different areas of our life. Now, we also have been building pictures of hope as we've gone along. So in the second step, we built visions in the nine areas, the nine islands of our life, and I made a picture of how our life could be beyond our wildest dreams. And we added to that a vision of what would be the characteristics of a power greater than ourselves that could bring about that kind of a change in our life. And we added to that a vision of the relationship between ourselves and that power. And that's what we said we're going to go for that in the third step. That's what we're going to work the rest of the steps towards, to have that blossom and bear fruit in our lives. Now we're building one more piece of vision here, which is our sexual ideal. And you think, what's that about? Right? We've got to talk about sex. Isn't this embarrassing to talk about sex? Well, it's a natural human instinct. And it's so much a part of self-esteem. What our beliefs about ourselves relative to our sexuality and our sexual relationships is so significant in how we judge ourselves and how we feel about ourselves. And they were quite clever when they snuck this into this part of the book. Imagine back when they wrote this book in the mid-30s, that they actually knew how to do that, and they got it in here. And we're still using that same format today and still getting positive results. How did they know that the things you would look at would be resentment, fear, and sex, and that would tell you about your patterns? Because sex is such an underlying thread interwoven into all different facets of our life. Sex drive is one of those primary drives that operates in, and it causes us to have interesting thinking and behavior. And for those of us who come from low self-esteem, low self-worth environments, sometimes this has become quite distorted because it's been a means of making ourselves feel okay. We've, we've used sex or sexual situations as a means of filling up a hole inside of ourselves, an emptiness. And it hasn't been healthy. And this is an opportunity to describe what would healthy be like here. What would a healthy, mature adult have as their vision of what, how, what role sex would play in their life and how they would be in sexual relationship? And that's what we write down here. What would that be like for us? Because that's what we're going for with these steps, bringing about the positive possibilities in our lives as a human being growing along spiritual lines, becoming the person we're capable of, not the person we used to be. So 
hopefully by this point, we've got a tremendous amount of information now, a tremendous amount of information on what our life has been like, what our life could be like, about how the human system operates, this whole thing about the conscious, subconscious, greatest subconscious. It's a simple model, but it's a valuable model in terms of thinking about change. Because it shows us exactly where the leverage point is. The leverage point is in updating those scripts right inside of our subconscious mind around the truth about who we are and what is appropriate thinking and behavior for ourselves and everyone else in the world. We've got a truth about everything in there. And if we can just inspect that, we can bring that script up to date, our life will go very much different in the future than it has in the past. And so that's what we're going to be looking at further on in this series is how would we reprogram that automatic pilot system if we choose to? By this point, we now have information about how it's been programmed and how it's operating to today. And we have some ideas about what we might like to program into it for the future. We're going to build on that through the rest of this series. Now is a good time to utilize the talking circle with your group. Focus on a subject which was discussed on the tape. If people are going to get back into balance, one of the things they have to do is seek the truth. Slow turtle, Wampanoag. 